تو گوش بگی ای تو ما رو خسته کده ای خیما ای گوشنگی ای لوچی ای یخ هر چیز از یاد ما رفته ها امید جو تھا وہ پہلے ہی ختم ہو چکا ہے نا جب ہم بی اے کر رہا تھا پڑھ رہا تھا ابھی سب کچھ چلا گیا میں اوریج ہو گیا ابھی یہی کولی کا کام نوستر کی سیرہ مو کہ آئی بینگا انہوں نے آجود امی سی میں سنگوری تا توما آندہ تی آتال پائی کہ بہا گنار بہا ترہ بہار جو میں بوئی اسی کو مستوی میں بوئی اوری تامین پیسہ ہی ہو بے تو سب کچھ ہو بے क्यों रास्ता न पैसे नहीं हो तो रास्ता सब बंद हो जावे पैसे हो तो सब रास्ता खुला होगे अभी तीस साल तो उम्र पूरी हो गई है दस साल और जिएंगे क्योंकि अभी आदमी की आयु से बहुत कम है संदेश में तो ये है कि आपने बच्चों को पढ़ाना चाहिए गरीबों के लिए ये संदेश है कि बच्चे को पढ़ाना चाहिए पढ़ेंगे तो कुछ आगे बढ़ेंगे नहीं तो हमारे जो हमारा जीवन है इससे बेहतर जीवन खराब होने वाला है सेश्ता फेरा पास आला तेरे पुस्कुआत कौन तुम्हारे नाल देनी में आकाश और पदानी अफ़ीले भाई हम मजूर आदमी क्या सोचे ये बदलाव मजूरी के अंदर जो मिलता है हमारा गुजारा चला लेते बच्चे भी कमाते हैं हम भी कमाते हैं दोनों का काम चलता रहता है अब चीजों में तो सबसे बड़ा राज ही है आप लोग दोस्त जीव आप लोग जीवन खड़वाया रहा पानी है वोटर एनिमी से ला मलाजी सुनो वोटर या पाव वोटर एनिमी पर लोम parce qu'on peut contrecarrer tout, mais la maladie... Je vais vous dire que si vous avez besoin de vous, vous avez besoin de vous, vous avez besoin de vous. Vous avez besoin de vous, vous avez besoin de vous, vous avez besoin de vous, vous avez besoin de vous. که اگر دیگر آبی می‌نن باز بی‌می‌نن باز خوب کار نمی‌شه که باز می‌گن که نه یاد دبای نخایم هستن. توی فلیج با همی پوریس هم تو آمدن را، چون که بیو فلیج دارم همی اجاره کنم کاسه، همی کاسه که کنم فامیلیا، همی مهره. بیو فلیج، چون که کیم هست، کیم هست، تیمو که اسیر. چون که ایشون دیگه چو اوریم سر بریم پوریس ها، نپوده سر، نپوده سرلو. تیمو که اومانارم. A lo que Dios me ha dejado y Dios tengo tiene que digamos como se dice sufrir a lo que estoy. Plein de gens ne te regardent pas quand ils passent dans la rue parce que ils veulent pas penser qu'un jour ils peuvent être comme ça. Tu comprends Non, faut pas regarder. Ou alors quand quand ils le voient. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us for this discussion of the issue that you've seen so dramatically illustrated here. I'm Strobe Talbot, and I'm privileged to be able to moderate what I think is going to be an extraordinarily good discussion. Because of the statistics that you just saw flashed on the screen here, the Global Governance Initiative, which has been working over the past year under the aegis of the World Economic Forum, has given our globe, all of the institutions and governments represented here and around the world, a failing grade in the effort to reach the United Nations Millennium Challenge goal number one, which is to cut in half the number of people who live in terrible poverty before the year 2015, which is only a little over a decade from now. 
And the issue that my colleagues are going to address over the next hour is very simply put, and that is how do we get to a passing grade as quickly as possible? And in particular, how do we get, to, how do we do a better job and do it faster partnering among governments, NGOs, corporations, and civil society groups, and I might add uh, the academy, thinkers and academics. And all of those are represented here. We're particularly privileged to have President Chisano of Mozambique with us here today. And he uh, is going to join me in listening to some opening thoughts by the other panelists and then give his unique perspective, not only as a national leader, but an international leader and somebody who represents what is best and most hopeful uh, on a continent that suffers more than any other region of the world from the problem of poverty. Sadako uh, 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 Ogata, who is the president of the Japan International Cooperation Agency, has introduced a new phrase and a new concept into the vocabulary for discussing this and other issues, and that is human security. And I'm sure she will want to touch on that in her opening remarks. Hernando de Soto is an economist whom William Jefferson Clinton nominated for the Nobel Prize in economics, although maybe he had in mind the Nobel Peace Prize uh, when he spoke to the forum uh, just the other day. And I'm sure that uh, Hernando will want to say something about democracy and transparency and institutions of governance as a crucial factor is in the fight against poverty. Mirai Chatterjee is the uh, moving force behind one of the most active and promising uh, NGOs that I've ever encountered around the world. It's the Self-Employed uh, Self Women's Association, which is active in six states of India, and she has worked on the problem of poverty reduction at the grassroots level. Uh, Dave O'Reilly, is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Chevron Texaco, a corporation which has been active in fighting the problem of poverty and other scourges of that kind throughout the developing world, and I might add particularly in the continent of Africa. And when President Bush made his own trip to Africa last year, he singled out Dave as a corporate leader who has contributed particularly uh, in, this in this struggle. Uh, Sadako, if you would be good enough to get us started. Thank you very much, Jim. Stroke, um, I am, we are all here very much concerned and committed to reducing poverty, and I am certainly one of them. But what I was, would like to do is to focus on a concept, human security, which I had the pleasure of co-chairing a commission to look into security matters. And I think this concept helps us focus on people, which is all about security matters as well. In today's world, we started with the assumption that in today's world, globalized world, there is no way to assure security of people by just focusing on the traditional state security apparatus and thinking. Because insecurity comes not only from external aggression or threats, but also through a globalized world channels of, let's say, SARS, or down down, sudden downturns in the world finances, all sorts of war, uh, across the border uh, migration problems. There are lots of things that disturbs people's daily lives. And when we went around examining what does security mean, for example, we had some uh, co consultations and talking with the the um, NGOs in South Africa, we were reminded that insecurity is the norm for many of the people, not security. So from there we had to examine what does, does it mean to be secure in today's world. I was the High Commissioner for Refugees, so I saw a lot of people insecure. And the causes of their insecurity was not external aggression very much. That was fighting within communities and within countries. And tra tra traditional security concept did not help them. So from there, we've started looking into what does it mean to be secure. 
you had to have two things. You had to have a functioning government that protects through the right kind of laws and so on. But you also had to have a very much of a bottom-up approach trying to give people education, health, social assurances and so on so that they themselves can participate and be part of a state or society and state coming together. And from there we did produce this concept of human security. But what does that have to do with poverty reduction? Just, uh, just a few sentences on that. We should focus much more on people. People and communities as the central focus for all our policies, whether it's education, health, participation in decision making, and to empower them so that the, the whole society can, can come up with much better assurances for their daily lives. When I say daily life, it means if you have security, you at least know what to expect the next day. And that is a survival issue. If you can start thinking about the day after tomorrow, then there, this is a society with opportunities. What we want to do is to meet, move people's lives from just a worrying about tomorrow to at least worry about the day after tomorrow. And that is a great leap in opportunities for people, and this is, it might be a little bit abstract, but this is one way of looking at poverty reduction. Thank you, Stockholm. Mirai? Um, thank you very much, Strobe. Um, I would like to share a view from the ground um, based on about over 30 years of working with very poor women in the informal economy. And I thought I'd start out from our experience just bringing out what it is in the struggle against poverty that works. And first of all, we have found organizing. That is the process of the poor and particularly women coming together, uniting, forming solidarity groups, and through this getting voice and representation, which touches on the issue of partnership in government committees and boards and places where policymakers make decisions um, about the poor and for the poor. And also that the poor should be organized into their own worker-run organizations. They may be cooperatives in some, some countries, collectives, self-help groups, mini banks at the village level or in the urban slum level. The other very important learning is capitalization. Our sisters at SEVA said, how can we ever come out of poverty if we are up to here in indebt indebtedness and in debt? And so capitalization, asset building of the poor, but particularly I would say in the name of women, this we find is a very important point in the struggle against poverty. Then social protection. We heard the voices of our sisters and brothers in the short film here. If we are constantly sick, if our children are constantly sick, how can we ever come out of poverty? So at least health care, child care, insurance and shelter in our experience are essential in the struggle against poverty and these should be preferably organized by the poor. We're not suggesting that large programs be implemented in a vertical manner but in a decentralized manner and preferably by the poor and women themselves. And the fourth learning we have uh, over the years is capacity building. Capacity building for leadership, skill building, to make decisions, to understand uh, how to work with policymakers, how to partner. And these are not in any kind of hierarchy, not one before the other, but rather coming together simultaneously uh, in the struggle against poverty. And of course we can't do it alone. The poor can't do it alone. And this is where the topic of today's panel comes into force, which is the whole issue of partnering. But what we have been saying, and certainly to our government, Strobe, is partnering uh, on equal terms. We want voice and representation on those very boards and committees which make plans, policies, budgets even. For the last several years, we have been in dialogue with our Ministry of Finance saying, it would be nice if you had a consultation before the national budget is put out. Uh, allocation of resources. Now we see in India a little bit of partnership is not just coming together, sitting in a room and planning together, but actually handing resources to the poor so they, that they can learn. Managing finance, financial resources, is the surest way to empowerment and the road to fight the fight against poverty. And finally, two other quick points. 
One is including the poor in monitoring and evaluation with access to information. We need to know where the money is going, how things are going and developing. We need to know in our district if very young children are still dying um, or whether we have indeed made progress. And finally, uh, these partnerships should promote economic self-reliance, should facilitate and create an enabling environment so that the poor are strengthened economically and they can take leadership in their own areas. Thank you. I think I'll stop right here. Thank you very much. Dave? Uh, well, thank you, Stro. But I think um, what I'd like to do is make a couple of points about what business uh, should do and can do to help alleviate poverty. Um, First of all, from a collective perspective, I think we need to speak out on the issues that can make a difference. Things like trade reform, for example. Agricultural subsidies are inhibiting the uh, many areas of the world from uh, benefiting uh, from the globalization that should be benefiting everybody. Debt relief, for example, which has been referred to already, and of course, uh, good governance. So I think as businesses, we can do this collectively. Now, from an individual company or business perspective, on the ground, we also need to perform. It is very easy to set up a business and do what we do well, invest and create jobs in the developed world, because there is infrastructure, there is, uh, there's education and health care, the things that many of us take for granted. But in the developing world, uh, investing and creating jobs and economic growth, both directly and collaterally, um, it's important, it's our primary role, but it doesn't occur unless we address some of the capacity building that Mariah referred to a few minutes ago. In the developing world, some of the things that we need to have in place, uh, education, health care, uh, in fact, food itself in some places, food supply is a, pro is a real problem. And we have tried to address that as, as a company alone in the past and have had mixed success. And we have reached the conclusion as a company that we do need to partner to effectively build capacity in the developing world. And partnering with the government uh, itself can be productive with government agencies such as USAID, multilateral agencies such as UNDP, and credible NGOs who are experts in capacity building. And we've been able to identify some of those that, uh, that are work, working very effectively. And I think we are now getting to the point where we recognize that partnering with multiple groups with the right expertise. We're good at investing, we're good at creating jobs, we're good project managers, but we're not good at agriculture. We're not good at, at food supply or food, food security and the like. Um, just one other final point. We have found that trust between the partners is an issue. Um, we have approached uh, uh, we have had some very credible projects that some, uh, what I expected, credible NGOs chose to back out of or stay away from because they're suspicious of our motives. And I think we have to overcome this. We have to trust as a business that, that others have a role to play and have something to offer, but also the uh, NGOs and the multilateral agencies that are sometimes suspicious of the motives of business need to cross that bridge as well. Because it's only when we build that bridge and we work together that we really will address the issues that are so important to uh, reducing poverty. Thank you. Hernando? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Strobe. Uh, before coming to this meeting, I saw that uh, one of the ways to pose the problem was to ask for this, uh, for this uh, session, what are the main obstacles to achieve a global marketplace that will allow the poor to access resources? It's pretty much what you've uh, which you've said as well, and I'll try and uh, answer, that, uh, answer that question, knowing that my answer will only be one of many, because there is no silver bullet in this development. It's still, to a great degree, of course, uh, uh, a mystery. What is not a mystery so far is that the only successful economic formula for development is a market economy system. If we have to put all the 200-odd countries in the world in a list and put an asterisk to those who are wealthy, they were all countries, they're all countries that have a market economy and that could accumulate capital. I think that is very important. And um, uh, what is also very important, as uh, Mr. O'Reilly said, is that if it's a market economy, one of the very important parts and the important components of the marketplace and of a market economy is, of course, trust, which is why I was uh, uh, so happy to come here to Switzerland 
where there's a country which is a market economy, it's a capitalist country and everybody trusts each other. Every time I, I stay in Peru, I'd say a lot of things and nobody trusts me. So I was really glad to come to a country where people were at least going to trust me. So when I came into Zurich Airport and they asked me who I was and I said, look, I'm Hernando de Soto and I explained that my mother came from Arequipa, my father from Moquegua, it's actually 350 years ago, we came from Spain, they said, look, will you show me your passport? And I showed them my passport and they began to trust me. So I came to the first conclusion, which is that people in the West and successful countries trust each other, not necessarily because they are who they are, they trust each other because there's a legal system that identifies you and tells you who you are in the marketplace. We may be uh, all brothers and sisters in this world, but there's six billion of us. So how do you, are you able to trust anybody unless you have some kind of a legal system that documents you, that identifies you? Then when I got into the Davos compound, uh, they only let me through when I showed my card, like all of you, and had to pass it on the badge. So again, another thing I found is that the Westerners do trust each other, but providing they can identify themselves very clearly. By the time I had registered in the hotel, they said, how will you pay your bill? And so again, I had a card that is a legal card <laughs> that basically says how much of my assets that I have in Peru are liquid and can come to Switzerland to pay for the Arangina, the, uh, the Toblerone, and uh, the hotel, and all the other things that are in place. Okay, here's what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that the victorious system of the, world, of the, of the Cold War has been a market economy and it's been a capitalist system. And capital travels on paper, and a market economy works because there's trust, and there's paper, and there's the rule of law. And if that isn't in place, nothing of the wealth creation is gonna come and come into place. And one of the characteristics about developing countries is that about 80, in average, 70 to 80% of the population is not within the legal system. They are not identified, their homes are not identified. In the United States, for example, uh, about 85% of all businesses that begin, begin on the basis of home equity. Now, if you don't have your home titled and you are not on the records, you can't mortgage. When you grow, you can then decide to call in other partners. For that, you require their investment, but you're only gonna give investment if you give them shares. And if you cannot issue shares, which are legal documents, it's not gonna work. The biggest challenge to the global economy is that so far of the world's six billion inhabitants, only two billion are in a position to actually participate in it and therefore get wealth. One billion are those people in the North Atlantic plus Japan and about four, four Asian tigers. And in the rest of us, our elites, which are about 20%, and they won't come in. Until we remember that capitalism and a market economy are essentially legal constructs, and those legal contracts are, constructs are not accessible to the majority of the population, the poverty will not be eliminated. Thank you, Stroke. I think it's in keeping with your thesis, uh, Hernando, that you managed to put in a plug for one credit card, one soft drink, and one candy bar in the course of that. Uh, uh, I guess Mr. My President, right afterwards. Sir. <laughs> Mr. President, would you uh, be good enough to give us your perspective on the basis of your experience, including you've led your country from war to peace, and you're now leading it in the direction of prosperity. And What do you think about both what you've heard and the topic before us today? Well, this uh, theme is a very vast one. I uh, would have a, a lot to say about uh, but I would first of all uh, like to agree with what uh, has been said. Uh, that uh, in order to fight against poverty first, you have to have peace. You have to have peace and uh, you have to have uh, security or, and stability. And uh, security which means not only the absence of war, uh, but also the uh, decrease of instability which may be caused by criminality. Therefore, we come here in, into a vicious circle because criminality is also, in many occasions, a originated by uh, poverty. Uh, insecurity may also be created by the poverty and, and big unemployment. 
so we have to tackle all these problems in each country, in each region, and worldwide. We have a program of the United Nations. We have the Millennium Goals, as you, you said at the beginning. Uh, but it seems to me that there's one essential thing which is missing, is the determination of all leaders, political, business, and leaders of the civil society as well, because there are many leaders in the civil society who speak, who criticize the government, who criticize the business, but they themselves in turn, they have to take a resolve for doing things and not just talking. We have to start doing things. I'm told that uh, if we want to, to reach the millennium goals, we'll have to increase by 50% the resources which are being made available. They speak about $100 billion now and, and $50 billion more would be required. I don't know whether these figures are correct or not, but I know that the gap is still very, very, very big. And I always maintain that it is not impossible to mobilize uh, uh, resources to meet the Millennium Goals. But what is important is for everybody to know that everybody benefits from the positive results in this struggle against the uh, uh, poverty. Uh, as you, the picture so showed there, the most part of poor people are in the uh, developing world and uh, mostly in Africa. But now, I agree with uh, uh, Ernani de Soto when he says that the uh, market economy is, is, is the system to follow. But when you come to Africa, you have to think, what are the bases of that market economy? We all came to independence. Uh, when the market economy meant the domination of the colonialists over the rest of the population. And to start this market economy and to play within the rules of this economy, of market economy, it's required that there is a good will from all sides, because otherwise the, the, poor, country, the poor people, the poor countries, will not be able to compete. When I uh, decided to change the constitution and to put more emphasis on the market economy and to become a constitutional uh, approach, I had to battle with myself. I was saying, but this will be a market economy for whom? This will be capitalism for whom? Who will be the capitalists? Therefore, there's a big effort which we have to undertake in Africa, and particularly in my country, to create this sense of businessmanship or womanship, uh, and to, to, to start to see, when we speak about empowering people, how do we start? Ernani has uh, some ideas. I know I read some passages of his book and we were saying that, well, the assets are there, they can be transformed in capital, the land is there, and uh, what not. Uh, it's true, but to do this, again, you need to build capacity, institutional capacity which may help these things to happen. And this, again, requires uh, resources in turn. Uh, we in uh, Mozambique, when we came to uh, independence, we had about 90% about of uh, illiterates, 90%. Today we're about uh, 50, 50 something. Uh, 
illiterate. And uh, we didn't have skilled workers. We didn't have uh, people who owned a, the smallest shop. We didn't have taxi drivers, let alone Mozambicans who owned taxis. We didn't have train drivers. All was done by the Portuguese. Now, we have to build this spirit of entrepreneurship. People have to know what to do. When the Portuguese left the country, uh, we tried to put people, for instance, in the farms, to organize them into cooperatives for them to take care of that land which was left where they were working. But uh, they were not accustomed to organize themselves, to manage themselves. It's something which they had to, to learn. We were new also in, in government, and we didn't have resources. Uh, so we have learned a lot of things. Let me uh, cut the, uh, the, the story short and, uh, and say where we are now. We have a, a program for the poverty alleviation. But we say that uh, a program of poverty alleviation, looking at the poor people alone and try to alleviate poverty, this will not be sufficient to eliminate poverty, absolute poverty. We need to orient this towards development. The fight against poverty must be based on programs of development. And uh, these are based on education, health, and uh, infrastructure. These are very important. Infrastructure which can support many initiatives of the peasants because uh, more than 80% of our population lives in the rural areas, and they, these are the illiterate. Together with all this, we have to develop the human uh, uh, resources, particularly women, and a special program must be focused on women, not at the exclusion of men. Now, in, in, in developing women, uh, we have to create special programs in education and in health services. And also in microcredit. Again, there, we have to have resources. We cannot, these programs we know that have, uh, they can be undertaken, but you have to start looking for resources. We may try to mobilize from within. Uh, a while ago I was talking with the Prime Minister of Norway and he was speaking about heavy taxation in his country. I said, well, my problem in, at home is that even the small, the, the, the low tax, taxation we have to think where to collect it from. Therefore, it's necessary to have, and here the private sector comes in, necessary to have investment and not just aid, the resources by aid. You come, as you rightly said, you come, you create jobs and try to transform the subsistence agriculture into commercial agriculture where it's possible. Let try to fight first for food security and then to create access for trade and try to create base, I agree, make better use of land through a good legislation on land 
And uh, then you you have to combine both private government, civil society, NGOs, and have a real national partnership where everybody will be resolved not to look to others what they are doing, but to have a common program. Our program to alleviate poverty has been discussed uh, by, uh, throughout the country, throughout the country. And now we have established also a consensus on how we are going to uh, set the development of our country up uh, from, for the 20 years to come. Because we think that the fight against poverty, it's not a short-term term program, but it's a medium and long-term program. That's why we cannot wait then and say, now we are dealing with poverty and then later we are going to deal with uh, development. Development and the eradication of poverty must go together with the participation of all parts of the society. Now, I come out from this uh, co co uh, cooperation within the country, this partnership in within the country, uh, to come to a wider partnership. In Africa, you know that we have set up a program to uh, expedite the combat against poverty, which is NEPAD, New Partnership for Africa's Development. It's primarily to combat poverty. And uh, here, again, we have uh, many uh, sides of it, capacity building, uh, the development of good governance, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, the infrastructure with, uh, in a partnership of all uh, components of the society of the whole continent. And then we go outside and we come to the partnership with the external world to Africa. And here is again where I have to, 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 to underline that no excuse should be uh, brought forward in order not to participate fully in this combat against poverty. There are many excuses. Uh, because one country there is misbehaving, because the other country there is misbehaving, we are afraid, we cannot move. Then this will be a, 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 a cycle which will never end. So we have to be convinced that we have to fight this struggle and and in combating against poverty and bringing development, also we are give, creating grounds to bring about go good governance. Both have to be worked at the same time and not waited. Those countries must have good governance, then we'll come. No. We go, we encourage the good, the positive things. We try to, to, to talk, to, to have a dialogue and we see the change coming in. And the change is coming. With NEPAD, I think a lot of change is coming. We have to interact. So the rule of law, we have to build it. We have to build it. It's not a ready-made suit. Thank you. Sadaka, would you like to say something yes, from the I, vantage I, point of a donor country? Well, I will, but I think what President Chesano has given just about the, a prescription for all the things that should be doing, and I have seen him from almost the day of his, the independence. But let me just also say about what you said, what De Soto said about passports, um, credit cards, and the uh, World Economic Forum. There, most of the people in the world don't have them, don't have any of them. And this is where the real problem of the world is. People who want to get out of poverty, start moving, <coughs> try to go to another country, seek asylum because they were persecuted, or want jobs, they don't get through. And I think this is the reality that we should look at. I am not so 100% sure about market economy being the answer. Because what you, that does give you growth. But also, there are many, many social and 
uh, safety nets that have been installed in order to make the benefits of the market economy be distributed widely. And from a point of view of a, uh, what is known, I don't like the word, but donor country development assistance agency, what we are trying to do is focus on the people themselves, communities of women, communities of uh, farmers and so on, not just of the top government people, because the development assistance just going from the top of the government, assuming that it got, gets down to the people, have proven not to be the case. So we do have to focus much more on the people themselves and through empowering them. Education, health that you have mentioned, but they also have to be linked because if you just give education to some people and health to another, it does not work that way. So link, I think partnership is a lovely word, but I would almost like to say linkages. You have to link various assistance in a way that if you're going to give agricultural de development and give farmers more way of producing crops, then you have to give them also chances to market. So there's a lot more linkages important in doing development assistance and my, my agency, Japan International Cooperation Agency, is really looking at empowering people as the main um, means of development assistance. I'm trying to bring down the focal point lower. So, and that's to the bottom up, is the only way I think you can really deal with poverty issues. Fernando and then Mariah. Thank you, Sro. Uh, I think there are very good points made by both uh, President Chisama, of course, and from you, uh, Madam, and uh, it just indicates the state of confusion which we are at this moment in the world because one of the reasons that market economy systems were put in the first place and the idea of popular capitalism as it was born in the West was as a matter of fact originally to empower people. Empower them against royalty, empower them against, against uh, uh, the, uh, uh, a, blue a blue blood class and to spread, uh, to spread wealth. This is the first thing. And of course that wasn't enough. One of the reasons that uh, the system survived in the, in the West, and the way it has, of course, also survived in Japan, is because it put in social safety nets and it made sure that it got to the people. One of the mistakes we made, for example, in Latin America, in at least five occasions since our independence from Spain, is we tried it and we empowered only a small uh, superior class. It didn't come down, and the result, of course, is that it's absolutely unsustainable if it's only capitalism for a few, as you would say, Mr. President. That is, that, is, uh, that is crucial, and we all absolutely agree on that. Nevertheless, I still insist on the fact that it is the key phenomenon that allows you to do the other things. For example, President Chisamo, you were saying you need resources. Here's our statistics for the world, and I'll even give you one country as an example. If you compare what, according to us, the informal people or extra-legal people, small enterprises have throughout the world, it is 50 times higher than all foreign direct investment. It is 90 times higher than all bilateral aid. And it is uh, 40 times higher than all World Bank loans. I'll give you the figures for Egypt, which has just been elaborated by the Egyptian government. In the case of the Egyptian government, the poor, who are in the extra-legal sector, possess in assets $248 billion. Uh, the, uh, that is 55 times higher than all foreign direct investment in Egypt since Napoleon was there, including the Suez Canal and the Aswan Dam. It is, uh, 90, it is uh, 90 times higher than all foreign bilateral assistance, everything you can give, even through NEPAD and the others, and it's 37 times higher than all World Bank loans. So the thing to remember, even this chicken and egg situation, is that the very people that you want to help are actually you're going to best through resources. What's missing, as you said, Mr. President, are the institutions. And without those institutions, those people who have more resources than you'll ever get from foreigners, we're not, we're not going to be able to produce. Property rights, which you were talking about before, Madam, how in Japan, in effect, one of the things you did just after the Second World War is extend property rights throughout the country and set up new institutions. You know, Madam, that uh, about in the 1930s, about a million Japanese uh, came to South America, a yes. million Japanese families. Among those Japanese families, there was one called the Fujimori family. They came to Peru. One of them, Alberto, as a matter of fact, became president of Peru. Now, in the other case, it was the Yoshiyamas, and they went to Brazil. Now, the question, madam, is the following. Why did the Fujimoris 
and the Yoshiyamas come to Peru and Brazil, and why didn't the Toledos and the Ludas go to Japan? And the reply for that is because then we were richer than you were. Our GNP per capita in Peru was 20% above that of Japan. Otherwise, why would they have come? But what you did, I will continue, but what you did, madam, is that in Japan you did a tremendous institutional reform and you empowered your people from the bottom up. That is also exactly what I'm talking, I'm talking about. Think of Switzerland itself, which is an interesting country. Up until 1908, Switzerland was the poorest country in the Western world. As a matter of fact, it was so poor that you can still find in the Swiss Constitution an article that says that all travel agencies of Switzerland are going to be controlled by the federal government in Bern. Kind of hard for a country that's so democratic and that even has seven presidents taking turns, but that's the way it is. Now, why was that? It was because up until 1908, the Swiss weren't concerned about who was going to Cancun or Tenerife. The Swiss were concerned about how many of their citizens were being exported as cheap labor to Latin America and to fight the wars as mercenaries for other countries. And at the same time, when they tried to do the tunnel of San Gotal that brings all parts of Switzerland together, they weren't able to raise one franc in Zurich. They had to raise it on the Paris market. But in 1908, they created the legislation and the institutions which empowered the small people and created a strong capitalism. So your question, Mr. President, is quite right. Capitalism, but for whom? That depends on what kind of legislation you put into place. And the reasons why you find hard, a hard reason to get replies from that from the West is because Westerners forget that they did that because they did it in the 19th century. But it's right there, Mr. President. A market economy is essentially a market of institutions and good laws. And those are the ones that will get you the wealth from where it really is that can help your country, and that is, surprisingly enough, among your poor people. All right. I wanted to uh, bring up uh, another point um, at the macro level which we face in the struggle against poverty, and that is what we often call conceptual blocks. Um, let me explain. When we first began to organize informal workers, the, the, the view that was coming from policymakers and the government was, no, no, there's no such thing and uh, we don't understand what's going on. And furthermore, we didn't have any data, we didn't have statistics. Uh, and this connects with your point, Hernando. I mean, where are the poor? They're quite invisible. They don't have the identity cards. And this was another issue, because if you don't know where the poor are, if you don't understand their reality, which is that most of the working poor of the world, and certainly in my own country, are in the informal economy. That means they have no fixed employer-employee relationship. So you have to take that into account and accordingly design poverty alleviation and eradication programs, programs to give them property rights and identity cards. Then really from the beginning you're quite stuck. But how do you get out of this? And this is where the partnership comes into play. We were able to collaborate with, our statistic, with academics, with our statistical institutes. In fact, in the, in the census at one point they showed in, in our state there were only 2,000 craftswomen, embroidery workers, at a time when we ourselves had organized 20,000 women and they were on our rolls. But we were able to bring out these kind of facts and work together and actually put numbers um, so that you can plan properly. And this is where grassroots partnership with organized, organized workers, organized uh, associations of poor, and combining with academics, with researchers, with policy makers comes into play. Now we can confidently say we are poor, but we contribute 63% to Indian GDP. We account for 55% of national savings and 47% of India's exports. And therefore, we, have, we should have a greater say in the allocation and in the budgets. That's one quick point I wanted to make. And the other point I wanted to pick up on something you said, Mr. O'Reilly, which is the whole issue of trust. It's not just trust vis-a-vis -vis large corporations, but also trust, you know, the poor, frankly, at least this has been my experience in my own and some other countries, they don't trust the outside world. The experience with the outside world has been difficult. It's been exploitative, or people have made promises and not kept them. And building trust is, is critical. And how do you do that? You can do that if you work together. And one small example I'd like to share, which is in the process of being upscaled in my home city of Ahmedabad, is among the urban poor who are living in slums. And we joined hands with our local municipal corporation, which is the city council, with the business sector, 
and the families themselves, the poor families themselves living in slums who did not have the basic amenities like water, sanitation and toilets. And let me tell you this infrastructure work in our view is poverty alleviation. So everybody joined together and the poor contributed. They contributed 2,000 rupees which is uh, divided by 50 quickly, about $40 I believe. Uh, per family, which is nothing, and business matched it, and the government added on a little more, and together they were able to build the toilets, the water taps, the sanitation. And how is this poverty alleviation? Well, because when we did a quick uh, impact study, we found that no longer women had to go stand in long water lines. The street vendors said, now we can go early to the market and get the best fresh produce and sell. Incomes went up, health expenditure went down, children who had to stand in water lines started going to school, and a whole chain reaction started. It's a small example, but in the process of being upscaled, and here again, partnerships with also development assistance. Now, the USAID is uh, supporting us in the capacity building because you have to then ha organize local groups who will maintain. It's not enough to put in the toilet, but the toilet should be maintained and shouldn't be broken down and the taps should be uh, constantly repaired and the pipes should be maintained. So all these things converging and coming together can have quite a powerful force and uh, we already see increased incomes, better food security, people are able to eat better, they said first we only ate a roti, which is like our tortilla, and salt and went to bed. Now we're bringing vegetables into the home. So these are the kinds of things that partnerships can sometimes trigger off. A small example, but I think these, are, these small beginnings are what point us in the right direction. Dave? Yeah, Strober, I'd like to build on a point that President Chisano made a few minutes ago, and, um, and also build on what Hernando said. I mean, I think we all agree that legislation and institutions and the like are badly needed, things like property rights and so forth, to really um, get the framework right for poverty reduction for the long term. However, um, do we wait until all this is in place? And I think the problem is we cannot. Um, there are some who say certain standards must be achieved in the world before investors come. And I just don't think this is very practical. I think there is, we need to commit to, um, government needs to commit to a program to achieve uh, the, the infrastructure, I mean the legal and property rights and, and that type of infrastructure. They need that in place. They need to have a commitment and move towards it. But it takes time to establish these things. And I fear that uh, if we all wait around, we won't get to where we need to be. Uh, I'll give you just one small example, because I want to put this in perspective. In Angola, it's gone through a very difficult time, many years of civil war, finally there is peace. Um, we we uh, recognized that, you know, Angola itself will acknowledge it doesn't have property rights. I mean, people have been displaced, millions of people have been displaced. So, but, but still, there is, a, there is a food issue, there is, a, there, is a, there is an issue of help that is needed. We cannot we have business in Angola. It's in our interest to have a healthy Angola. We, will, we want to make money. We will make money in Angola, but we won't make it if society doesn't function if people can't eat. Partnering with USAID and World Vision has led to uh, a return to the farms. People are growing again. People are not just, not just taking aid for food, but they are taking seeds and planting and growing. Pretty soon there will be seed growing and seed businesses that will come from this. Not all the property rights are in place, not all the uh, infrastructure that is needed are in place, but it's a start. And that's just the point I want to make. I think it's important that we recognize that this is a journey and that we can't reach the destination right away. And if we trust one another and work together uh, as institutions, as businesses, and as people at the local level, we will make progress. Dave, do you want to say a word or two about the policies of your own government and ways in which U.S. government policy and legislation can make it easier for a company like yours uh, to do good while it's doing well abroad? Well, I, I think the main issue for me is, um, is trade. I would like to see us uh, reactivate the Doha round and really address the issue of agricultural tariffs and subsidies because um, 
this can be an enormous help. Now, the AGOA, the Africa, you know, the, the Gro Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, a bilateral agreement between Sub-Saharan Africa and the United States, doesn't do enough. The problem is we are paying cotton farmers to grow cotton and driving the price of cotton down for cotton growers in other parts of the world, for example. This is inherently wrong. And I think we have to address these issues. And I, I would, I would if, if I were to pick one thing our government could focus on, it would be re-engaging on the, uh, on, the, on the agricultural issues in particular in the Doha round and trying to bring the Europeans along. Because frankly, a cow in the United States or Japan or Europe earns more than a billion and a half or two billion people per day. The subsidy for a cow is higher than what people earn in sub-Saharan Africa and many parts of Asia, and that just doesn't seem right to me. Fernando. Thank you, Stroh. I think David uh, made a few interesting points, but I would like to reply to them. Um, the first thing that is, uh, that is important is this. Nobody is denying that poverty alleviation is not a good thing. It is a good thing. Every life saved, every year you can add to somebody's life uh, is, of course, a great thing. But what we're talking here is about poverty and the possibility of economic takeoff. Here's what happens, for example, when Europeans or when, ba when, uh, when basically Northerns really want to help each other what they do. When the European Union got together, uh, it created a process for helping other countries that wanted to come into the European Union. And that's why about 20 odd years after it was formed, uh, Spain, which was a country that had more or less the same GNP per capita as Argentina and was receiving foreign aid, they didn't just simply toss poverty alleviation money to them, which was all right. What they did in the process of aquí communautaire was give them something that is, that is called institutional assistance. During about 15 years, hundreds of technocrats of the European Union and the Spaniards went around and changed the institutions so that they had good property rights, so they had good company law, and so they could trade internationally. The result is that today Spain has four times the GNP per capita than, uh, than, um, um, than uh, Argentina. Uh, now, this is interesting. Every time the Europeans want to help each of their neighbors, they don't talk about the things you talk about. They talk about the change of institutions. And what happens with those institutions, you really start getting development. The second point that you talk about is that nothing may be in Angola of the property rights that were changed. I don't know specifically what there is behind that. But from everything I've seen, not being an expert in Africa, most of the wars of Africa are about property rights and territory. So until you get that settled, it's going to be pretty difficult to get lasting peace. Moreover, in your own country in the United States, you finally settled all the violence that Abraham Lincoln criticized, including the invasion of California during the gold rush, which, by the way, belonged to Mexico, not to you. And at that time, when you finally settled, it was when the 800 communities or tribes of gold rush people finally agreed to law and property rights systems. Now, moreover, the most interesting thing about the United States during the 19th century, which you can read in law books, and we can see through Clint Eastwood films on how people settled everything at gunpoint, your history is full of it, was basically settled by putting in 32 preemption acts, which brought in at the same time, right at the end, the Homestead Act, and gave power and empowered poor people from the bottom. So I'd have a question for you, generally speaking, Dave, because it interests me socially, which is why, when you started development and nobody was giving you foreign aid and it's worked so well for the United States when it comes to our countries you change policies. I, I'm, not advocating, I'm not advocating a change in policy at all. I think we're violently agreeing. I think we do need the institutions. We do need what you say. I'm just making the point is you can't wait for all of it to be in place. It takes, even in Spain's case, I'm sure it took more than a year or two. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm just making that point. I'm not advocating aid. I'm advocating investment. I'm advocating human capacity building. And I think, I think those are absolutely congruent with the, uh, with the installation of institutions. Um, um, I, I'm not an expert on African uh, peace and, and war. I defer to 
uh, Honorable President on that subject. I'm just making the point that uh, this is not, I mean, we can go through economic history. I want to go forward, and I agree with you on the, on the institutional comments that you've made. Absolutely. Because if we want to go forward, and you permit me just one little point, let's get out of Africa, let's go to Mexico. Foreign direct investment in Mexico is only, is only 1 29th of the value of what poor people already just have in their homes. So if you really want to go fast, do you wait for foreign direct investment or you do start developing institutionally your own poverty sector so they can pay away for it the way you did in the 19th century? I'm what I'm trying to say is the biggest takeoff policy are the institutions. But you are only going to get the resources to do the kind of policies you want once you're able to produce your own wealth. That's the order in which these things come, not the other way around, though it sounds generally much more generous. Sadaka. I don't know whether I understand the, the meaning of institutional uh, change and institutional building correctly, but in many places they never came peacefully. You have, when things went wrong long enough, there were liberation fighting, there was uh, uh, internal conflict, there was all sorts of rough means were taken in order to correct the institutions. And I think it's a big, big challenge for the World Economic Forum to say partnership for peace and prosperity. There has never been major institutional change just through partnership. And I think this is something that we have to be rather uh, humble about. It's a very daring thing that the World Economic Forum is proposing. Also, aid and investment. Aid is given before investment comes. And I have been in Afghanistan, I think the same thing with, in many, many places. Aid is given because investment is so slow in coming until the situation is so stable and profit prospects are clear. And this is where a lot of the aid is gaining time. So those were just some remarks I wanted to add. Mr. President, we're going to give you, if we may, the last word. Thank you very much. I, uh, I would like to, to say a few things which I didn't uh, mention when I first spoke. Uh, on the participation of the private sector. Um, I think that uh, it's not just uh, to invest and create jobs. It's to have uh, an attitude to participate in uh, poverty alleviation by setting in their companies some programs which may uh, enable the workers who have got a salary to make better use of this salary and improve uh, their standards of living, but also starting a new uh, line of uh, uh, development programs. Um, and also to li link the, the work they are doing, these companies, with the, the people surrounding the companies who can uh, have the small businesses they, of this sort, uh, Madam uh, uh, okay. Mirai said, uh, that, but they, they, this would to be interconnected, this can be done. And also to get interest in fighting disease, malaria, HIV, mainly this, and programs of sanitation. These are investments in health, in health which m will get return to the company. Maybe it may be invisible at the beginning, but uh, later the investment in training of personnel will be a uh, far more rewarding. So the social dimension of investment must be uh, uh, there. Again, uh, the other thing which I didn't say is about uh, uh, the need to convert the informal sector slowly into a formal sector. Substance, uh, subsistence agriculture into a commercial agriculture because the informal sector may now be the, the, the one which is bringing more income for the country and so on but it's not sustainable 
uh, we, we, the economy must be sustainable. And that's why I said to fight against poverty, you have to bring in development. And development cannot be just through the informal sector. It's something which is a transition, some, it's a passage which we may have to, 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 to bear with, to live with, but it cannot be the last thing. Um, and uh, I, I would like also to support the idea of these uh, subsidies uh, in, in, a, in, a, in the developed countries, uh, which are contradicting uh, the opening which uh, it's being made by uh, for the markets uh, and the, some impositions sometimes they open the market and they close it at the same time uh, because of many procedures and many conditionalities for access to those uh, uh, programs like uh, uh, the AGOA and uh, all but arms uh, 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 well, uh, I, I could give the examples of sugar, how, how we are, it's difficult for us to sell sugar uh, uh, and other products. So we may say all but arms and sugar, and things that I like, because uh, we have problems. Uh, Cancun, it was all about all these products, uh, not there they spoke about cotton. Uh, so all about, uh, but cotton, and so uh, we have to, uh, but this is, is within that goodwill which I spoke about at the beginning. And finally, as about, uh, Hernani spoke about institutional reform. Well, if, uh, if, uh, if uh, we were there in Mozambique to speak about institutional reform would be glad. Uh, but we are not there yet. We are still in institutional building. We have to create the institutions. Sometimes from the scratch. We may be blamed that we have bad judiciary, uh, we have bad uh, uh, legal system, but all this have to be uh, all Revise that it's not, it's not a, a, just a reform, it's to create new laws, new laws which are adaptable to the uh, uh, in independent Mozambique. And we don't have a model to go and copy because the Portuguese themselves are, are changing everything there. But this is what we have is what was left to us. And uh, we have to create even the, the, the legislation itself. But furthermore, we have to train. The, uh, 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 the, the, the lawyers, uh, the juridical people, uh, to train them. And also, we have to give incentives. Because uh, these young people, when they come out from uh, the university, they want to make some money also. And if you, you say you are a judge, and with all the limitations that a judge has, uh, many are not interested. They are not interested. So we, we have to create these institutions uh, in, in Africa. Therefore, we must be helped for a long period. We must be helped. The aid, the aid must be there. But I'm saying we can combine the aid with the investment, which uh, then may have a return to the countries which, which are uh, investing, and train the appropriate pers personnel this is a capacity building also. And that's why the emphasis on education. Now we have a reform on education. We are a new country, but we already are introducing reform in our education system in such a way that our young people, when they come out from the school, at any level, they may know how to do something, how to transform this potential wealth we have these resources which we have, and not to, to have many unemployed. We are unemployed because they are not having a salary, but they can do things by themselves and be uh, self-employed people. Uh, and this is lacking. 
This will require some training on management and so forth. So things must go step by step, but in a very firm, continuous movement. And presumably, Mr. President, faster as well. I'm sure you would agree. As you were bringing our conversation to a close, there was a lot of head nodding here among the panelists. And if I could see more clearly out into the room, I suspect among the audience as well. So we thank you for that. It's been a terrific discussion on a cosmically important subject at the end of a long day. I hope all of you will join me in thanking our five panelists.